This is going to be a review of one book uh, written by a recent, or rather not so recent, Russian immigrant to Israel that recently appeared in uh, a Moscow Jewish uh, publishing house. I want to give just a little bit of context to understand what it is all about. Uh, there was once a real literature, a good piece of writing, written simult simultaneously in the 70s, or rather from the 70s on, and is still being written, uh, by people who came first from Soviet Russia, then from uh, what was left of Soviet Russia, and they're coming even now. There is nothing special in this phenomenon, uh, an Amy Gray or whatever, uh, literature uh, written in a country by, uh, in a different language than the surrounding one. In fact, we are learning now that there have been many such literatures or sub-literatures in Israel. Uh, which were, however, totally unknown to anybody, received no press, no appreciation, nothing. Indeed, there is a English-Israeli literature, French, a Czech, a huge Hungarian-Israeli literature, lots of them in any language, mostly Eastern European languages. And this uh, Russian-Israeli uh, literature uh, was likewise uh, totally ignored by the literary establishment. But the people who came here still went on writing like mad. And they kept on writing and produced immense qualities of novels, hundreds, maybe tens of hundreds of them. Uh, of poetry, I don't speak even. And it was a real flood. And the question arose, what it is all about? What it is? What is it? Is it Russian? Is it Israeli? Is it Jewish? Is it non-Jewish? Sometimes it was very un-Jewish. And of course, it couldn't be defined as Russian literature in, because it was not, uh, not about the subjects that Russian literature was used to. The piquant thing was that the writers did not want to be considered Russian writers. Those writers thought themselves Israeli. We are an Israeli writers. We are writing an Israeli literature only in the Russian language. But they, they probably expected uh, some welcome from the local literary establishment, which of course they didn't get. I would no longer be in a hurry to assess who is central and who is peripheral in Russian literature. Because the writer may stay in Israel, like Dina Rubina, the famous Russian writer, and be considered a prominent Russian writer. Or she or he may sit in Moscow, like Linor Goralik does, and uh, be an Israeli writer. Or my favorite example is Alexander Ilichevsky, who works in Hadassah and writes Russian novels that receive Booker Prizes, <laughs> and recently who published a wonderful metaphysical novel about Jerusalem. OK, but Ilichevsky is too well known. I want to speak about another Israeli writer who is less known. Has anyone seen? A publication, a book, an essay, whatever, about Russian life in Israel so that everything was not terrible, not, my, not nightmarish, not hostile, but on the contrary, happy. And this uh, writer I want to present here, uh, I think, manages to do exactly that. Yes, here it is, this publication. Please, I am speaking of the writer Anna Isakova and the little book that she recently published, uh, which is called Gittel and 
the Andromeda stone. You know, Andro Andromeda stone is that rock in Jaffa, in the sea near the uh, shore of Jaffa. It is published in Moscow, this I said, by the publishers Knižniki, which is very good. The author, Anna Isakova, uh, has come from Vilnius. In Israel, she, uh, she has been since 1972 and worked all the time as a doctor in Sheba, in the famous hospital of Sheba, now Tel Shomer. She was a pioneer of Russian-Israeli press when this appeared and headed uh, a well-known, yeah, legendary now, uh, first Russian big newspaper, Vist. Later, Isakova was an advisor on Russian things, on Russian matters, to Prime Minister, to the Israeli Prime Minister. As this novel that I'm going to speak about is about her acquaintance, no, not her, her heroine's acquaintance with Israel. The most appealing thing about Anna's book is its openness. The heroine doesn't think even of working uh, along professional lines. She has a too rare profession for that. And she's ready to do anything. She's learning Hebrew. She's opening herself to the new world. But this new world is very complicated. She sees this life as a confrontation of multiple forces. Yes, and it's really tantalizing to see how they fight. But the most interesting thing about this book is uh, the people. There are market beggars with a million dollar, each one with a million dollar biography fit for Hollywood, yeah, about the Shoah and so on, for a film about the Shoah. And disillusioned kibbutzniks and pious plumbers and even brave Israeli colonels turned uh, suspicious businessmen. And all with their own language, the heroine's own origin from Vilna, uh, makes it easier for her to decipher this life, because she knows by birth five languages. Because Vilna speaks in five languages, used to speak in five languages, Lithuanian, Polish, German, Yiddish, and Russian. And so Hebrew just comes the six. But Isakova's book is not really about the picturesque Jaffa. It's really about history, uh, about how history directly concerns us. And the first example is how a Jewish girl from the formerly hermetically closed Russia feels for the first time the wind of history on her shoulders. Here is she, here she is wandering in Tel Aviv and sees a far pharmacy on the corner with a date opened in 1937. And she thinks, ha, huh, this place must be German. And of course it is. And she thinks, in Israel, the history of the world, that's a quotation. In history of the world, you just see it. There was a pogrom in Kishinev and a kibbutz appeared on the ancient land. Poland was divided and a village was formed here. A certain Schickel Gruber came to power and here a pharmacy appeared on Schenken Street. And so on from the beginning of time. The flood, an ark, the pyramids, manna, they destroy our temple. We hang harps on the willows. And finally, a few words about the plot. The heroine is a saleswoman at an antique shop, and she wants to go separate, independent. She wants to discover an unknown artist and launch him. And uh, there is nothing, but suddenly uh, there appears, there appears a file of drawings out of nowhere, and it seems that they have no other, no other uh, owner than the heroine. And this new unknown, totally unknown name uh, belongs to some 
really very elusive figure. The drawings are wonderful. It's a cross between a kind of Chagall with some mystical, dazzling symbolist like Odilon Radon. Uh, so it appears from her descriptions. Nothing ever, anyone ever has seen. And so she decides to, to find this, this man. And it turns, well, this becomes the axis, the somewhat detective axis of the novel. And she finally finds the man. And this uh, proves the key to all the strange things in the book and the answer to how she is connected to all this quite improbable story. And it's very interesting, and it creates a real suspense, and I think mm, this is worth reading. What is a novel? A novel is an instance of different cultural, linguistic, uh, social strata communicating, talking to each other, understanding, misunderstanding. Well, a battle of languages, a battle of cultural codes, and for a reader, uh, which is society, this is like a mirror shown to that same society, a mirror to see itself, to assess itself, to enjoy itself. And I think that all those characters who speak, as Isakova shows in Russian, because the novel is in Russian, but really they think, and really, in reality, they're supposed to speak each in his own language, in Ladino. Yeah? And it is shown, you can feel it's Ladino, in Yiddish, in a kind of a Hasidic dialect, and so on and so forth, and it's all is presented in the richest Russian possible. I think this is a, a novel which fulfills its primary function. It shows the society its own richness. And this is exactly what literature is supposed to do. And I think that Anna Isakova has managed in her uh, Gittel and the Andromeda Stone has managed with this task very, very well.